Today's guest is... Carrot Kuro, the developer of Mythcaller the Nightmare Shaman. So, Mythcaller the Nightmare Shaman is a 3D platformer fused with a monster catching game. It's kind of like Mario 64, where you're jumping around, you're collecting these tokens that allow you to progress in the story, but also you're catching monsters, you're actually catching the enemies that you fight, and you're able to transform into them, fuse them together to mix their powers together, level them up, do basically everything you can do in a monster catching game, but also in the world of something like Mario 64 or Banjo-Kazooie. A lot of people assume that I was inspired by Demon Turf or uh, Sonic Robo Blast 2, but actually I didn't know about those games when I first started. I first started doing this game in 2016 in Game Maker. Game Maker has a, or at least used to, have a default 3D tutorial thing that was kind of like Doom and I thought well what if I make a third person camera instead of a first person camera I janked around with it for a little bit and eventually I made one that was halfway decent but Game Maker wasn't really sufficient for what I was doing the yeah. frame, frame rate was, wasn't good enough. enough the lighting wasn't good enough so I moved on to other projects for a while until I picked up Unity started learning that and then I was like well then what if I I pick up that 3D game again, and I just made it in the same graphical style. And then a few months later, people are just like, Oh man, uh, you were inspired by Faz, right? The guy that made Demon Turf? And I'm like, who's that? So where did the idea for your game come from? I had a franchise before this game called Xander the Monster Morpher. Mm -hmm. It was a 2D game where it was in a top-down perspective and it was a monster catching game mm. where you would use kind of bullet hell combat while also catching the monsters instead of platformer combat. I just took that idea and took it into 3D. <laughs> what inspired you to make games in the first place? So it's kind of funny, uh, when I was maybe 13, my friend, out of nowhere, he sent me a copy of Game Maker 8. It had just come out at that point, and I'm just looking at it like, what am I even looking at? I, I had no idea how to program a game, I had no idea why he wanted me to do this, but he just said I'd be good at it. So I put it down, and I said, no, I can't do this, I, I have no idea how to program, I don't know what I'm doing. But for some reason, and it just kept nagging in the back of my head that, you know, maybe I should check it out. So I booted it up again one day and I followed the super basic tutorial that they had back in 2009. Back in those days, indie games were a much smaller thing. So the Game Maker tutorials that you could find were either very, very small, very, very specific, incredibly wrong. <laughs> like, I saw quite a few that just said things that were straight up false. And then you had the default one. So I just did the default tutorial mm -hmm. and it kind of snowballed from there i thought okay yeah that's cool i did this little rail shooter what if i try making my own sprites okay that worked uh what if i try making my own animations okay that worked what if i try making my own level structure like what if it goes from level to level instead of just being an arcade game and it just kept snowballing and snowballing over the course of like a decade mm. until eventually yeah completely self-taught from how you say it it wasn't free like a dream to make games nope i wanted to be a novelist i wanted to mm. write books and that was it books that you don't play through i mean that being said i, I was always into games and the power of juju is a really big inspiration mm. it's just like this a game that always made me laugh when i was a kid i always wanted to make cutscenes like that where like they were super cinematic but they were also just really funny and cartoony uh not like how a lot of cinematic games just try to be like overly serious so that's where a lot of the inspiration for the cutscenes in particular came from and there are also a lot of really small things like the level structure with the doors that you open to get to different levels i was mostly thinking of a game called scooby-doo night of a hundred frights when it comes to that <laughs> yep scooby-doo <laughs> uh one of my biggest inspirations honestly when it comes to game design that's definitely uh, that game... not the first thing when i uh, that i think about when I see your game. <laughs> really? Yeah, it's like... I mean, honestly, not Mario 64 or Banjo-Kazooie either. Until 
you see yeah. the platforming, but at first sight, it looks like it's mostly inspired by old JRPGs, I would say. To yeah, me, at least. Funny yeah. Uh, the funny thing is, I don't really take inspiration from games in the same way that you see from a lot of uh, indie projects, mm -hmm. where it's like, I I'm super inspired by Zelda, and it's basically like, uh, they took Zelda, and they just added on top of it, more or less. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. If you really like Zelda, then it's amazing! You know, it's more Zelda that you can have, and it has quality of life improvements. Oh, it's great. But uh, what I normally do is I'll be inspired by, you know, little specific elements of a game, mostly like little bits of structure or how specific levels made me feel and whatnot. And I'll take that and I'll put those aspects into my game in a way that makes sense with my game. Mm. So uh, even though I say Mario, even though I say Scooby-Doo, even though I say uh, Tack, the actual game itself, I wouldn't say is inspired by any specific game, and I wouldn't really say that the structure itself is super comparable to really anything else, just because it not that kind of game. Mm. Is there maybe like outside of games stuff you take inspiration from? Like how, for example, um, the developer of Pokemon took inspiration from catching bugs? Oh, definitely. I do follow the Nintendo design principle when it comes to that of uh, taking things from my real life and putting them into the game. Uh, mostly to do with the story. A lot of the stories in my games are metaphors for things that I've personally gone through and felt. Mm. And a lot of the characters are based on people that I've met. You know, of course, cartoonized. They they don't actually resemble <laughs> the real people, but the feeling and the kind of mannerisms that they will have, uh, they'll be based on the people that I've actually met. And I would say that's probably the biggest inspiration with the game is things that have happened to me, not really other games. Mm. Apart from that, how, what kind of game design principles do you follow? So I... When it comes to building levels and building the design of the game, I kind of follow a principle of what is the most fun that I can squeeze out of any moment mm. of the game. Like, if ever I go through a section and I say, like, it was just okay, it was serviceable, it looked nice or whatever, I would always go back through it and fundamentally change something about this stage. I wouldn't just move around platforms, move around enemies, adjust values or whatever. And that does take a while because that does mean I'm redoing segments over and over and over and over and over again before they get perfect. But that is something that I really hold dear when it comes to game design is just that constant honing, never being, I guess, complacent in a level design or a character design or whatnot. Just always keep hammering away on those little details, on those big details, just until the section is perfect. Uh, a matter of fact, yesterday, I made a section in a new level I was working on, where the player would grab an invincibility token that would grant them invincibility for a little bit, and they would have to run through a corridor and avoid all of these enemies and whatnot. And it just was not fun until I completely changed the way the platforms in that segment worked. Instead of you jumping on them and they would kind of boot you off in order to make it last a bit longer. Mm. I had the platforms always move, so ahead of time you can kind of see the platforms and plan out in your mind like, okay, my invincibility is running out, uh, wh where's that platform going to be? But that was just an example, yeah. you know, I, I, I never settle, mm. I guess. Would be a more succinct way to say that is mm. I always go through every single section of the game and if there's even a single tiny thing that I don't really like about it, that I don't think is fun, it either gets taken out mm -hmm. or it gets changed fundamentally until it is fun. Yeah, that's kind of how I've tried editing the last YouTube video I did. I tried to remove everything that isn't particularly interesting or doesn't, yeah. add, uh, doesn't add any value to the video. I've asked this kind of face as well. What is like your design principle when making or designing monsters? So with the monsters, the sprites come first. The actual big blown up art comes afterward and and i just kind of think what does this level need i design the levels first then the monsters and i know that 
can be kind of strange for a monster catching game but with the monster catching and the platforming being so intertwined with each other i kind of need to think about them in the same type terms so I'll have a level with a lot of verticality, for example, and I'll think like, well, okay, you know, it'd be really good here. I, uh, a guy that can like throw down rocks from above. So you get this challenge of dodging them as you're trying to ascend. Or like if you're in an area where there's wind coming up from the ground, so you're floating. Uh, what if I had monsters that had skills that kind of bobbed and weaved in the air so that you would have to bob and weave to avoid them. And then I would think, well, what kind of monster would would use an attack like that. I would kind of workshop that, maybe mm. make some kind of pun for its name. Uh, throw it in the level, tweak it, and that's basically the process. Yeah, that, that's different from what you hear usually, I think. Because usually, I guess the focus is less on uh, like making the monster fit to the, what do I say? To the environment and more making the monster like something appealing for the player yeah like of course i try to make them appealing mm. but the first thing that i'm thinking about is uh how is this gonna work gameplay wise with this level and how mm. is this monster gonna fit yeah and i'll also think about things like uh because the attacks in the game are in real time you have different styles of attacks like shotgun attacks that like spread out uh attacks that lob like uh grenade type things and I'll think like, oh, I haven't had a grenade type monster in a while. Maybe I can make a fusion that has a grenade or like mm -hmm. make some kind of corner of this level. I have a little mini challenge where a uh, grenade monster would be fun, like a place with a lot of verticality and whatnot. So that's kind of another aspect that I consider. How, how is it to have like people make content around your game? It's really cool. I love it. Uh, it's one of my favorite aspects of being on social media and having the game be out there uh, whenever i see content on youtube i'll try to post it in the discord and whatnot if i see mm -hmm. the fan art on twitter i'll try to retweet it if i see it you know they'll have to at me or something so i can actually you know know it exists but when whenever it does happen it's so gratifying it, it's so how do i put this it, it kind of gives me a renewed reason to keep going if i ever have a bad day if i'm ever making a level design just not working out if i'm making a sprite and i just think it looks ugly no matter how many times i redraw it i'll go to my twitter and i'll see a, a bit of fan art or i'll see a gym leader ed video or whatnot mm -hmm. and i'll just think like y you know what there's a reason why i'm doing this i i can do this eventually i yeah. will yeah. try my best no matter what hurdle i'm currently stuck on i know i can get over it because i know i have these people that are really excited for the game and i really don't want to let them down do you still sometimes like struggle with losing motivation and how do you how do you work around that i guess oh definitely <laughs> definitely uh, making games never really gets easier especially if you're constantly doing new things i like this is my first 3d games first game in unity mm -hmm. it's first game that I'm doing a lot of the smaller things with. Like, it's my first game with real-time combat that has uh, power-ups, like invincibility and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Even small things like that can provide huge hurdles that just kill my motivation. Doesn't matter how many games I put out before this. Uh, if I'm staring at the same room in the game for a solid week, yeah, <laughs> my motivation's gonna be shot. Yeah, so... so yeah. So... I just kind of have to keep those spirits up. It isn't really something that goes away per se, but it's something you kind of learn to deal with in healthy ways as time goes on. How do you handle criticism? So it, it depends on the criticism and it depends on where it's coming from. Like good, honest criticism, I do take and strive and I do consider all of it. If you do criticize the game, even if it seems like I'm not really paying attention to it first that might just be because i'm legitimately thinking about what you say mm -hmm. uh so because i've had some people criticize it on discord and whatnot and i was silent for a few moments and they were just like no no you know you don't have to follow this advice and i'm just like wait <laughs> hold on hold on slow your roll i'm thinking about it mm -hmm. you know i do consider all criticism except if it does not come from a constructive place if someone yeah, comes but... up to me and 
Legend is just like, You copied off of Pokemon! Nintendo's gonna sue! Uh, then I, I um, don't see how it's anywhere close to Pokemon, to be honest. Oh my god, I should show you my DMs. <laughs> I'm not joking when I say that people have actually been like that with me. Where uh, that... they have accused me of copying off of Pokemon. And I'm like, dude, I'm gonna be real. I, I haven't liked Pokemon since, like, <laughs> Gen 4. How do you build, like, a community? How do you advertise your game and get people to talk about your game? <laughs> Isn't that the golden question? I don't know. <laughs> I kind of lucked out. So, with this game specifically, I just post on social media a lot, a lot of GIFs. I kind of learned how to game twitter to make it so that the posts don't just get buried a lot of little things that you have to do really and it changes every now and again too they change the algorithms every now and again and it oh yeah ooh, gets me salty <laughs> because then i have to kind of trial and error relearn everything is that like, something that like you how do you get to know when the algorithm gets changed i actually don't know that this is just something you notice when posts suddenly don't get the same amount of views as normal or is it like i mean i assume twitter doesn't announce it yeah it's just complete trial and error every now and again i think they'll announce it i think they've announced it like once in the time mm. that i've been paying attention that they were changing the algorithm maybe twice <laughs> i forgot maybe like once in 2018 or something but the main thing is yeah just trial and error noticing patterns in things that not only you post but it, when other people post i just kind of pick up on things that do well what times are they posting how often often are they posting because things like that can either boost your place in the algorithm or they can absolutely murder it and make it so that your post has three views even though you have 5k plus followers so mm. that you know it's a game in and of itself that yeah I, re I remember having the same thing with instagram where like i mean obviously not as big but i got like maybe 100 likes per drawing i made and then suddenly like from one day to another every drawing got like 20 and i was like what the heck is happening there was even something that happened to me semi recently i think it was around a month ago where whatever i would post it was seen by no one like literally mm. only people that would visit my page would see it and i just the fix was to completely stop posting for a week and then everything was fine after that and i'm just like that's weird what <laughs> yeah i, I, mean, I this... don't get why yeah did, did you like post too many posts in a day or what was that <laughs> the weird thing is it, that couldn't have been it because i don't i know people that post a lot and they're constantly mm. on my feed they'll post like five times a day and i'm like could you stop <laughs> oh my god i don't want to like mute you or anything because i like the things that you say but why do you say so much mm -hmm. but i only really post a maximum of like once a day mm. and even then usually less so I don't know what happened. Yeah, that's weird. But it weird. did appear that I was being shadow banned and I had no idea why. Of course, I also don't say anything inflammatory on Twitter. I'm, it's a game dev account. I don't say anything political. I don't say anything uh, that would make the algorithm just want to murder me. But mm. hey, it sure was intent on doing that anyway. Yeah, I've had weird experiences with Twitter too. One time my account got blocked because it said that I was below 14 when I, when I was 19. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I, Twitter can be weird. Yeah, it definitely can. And that's kind of the thing is like, there's no sure fire way to build a big community as an indie. Like as a AAA, yeah, you just throw a bunch of money at commercials and ads and whatnot. And you're golden. But we don't have that luxury being mm. indie. We have to do everything organically for the most part. You know, I do have a publisher, but mm -hmm. we haven't really worked worked with each other that much yet things have been kind of slow due to the uh, the geopolitical climate at the moment so mm. you know things have been kind of rough with that uh, with getting physical materials and whatnot kickstarter yada yada but the publisher aside i I have to do it all organically. So building a community just has to come down to posting about it, making sure everything looks really nice. That's mm. really the number one thing. And hoping for the best, hoping you get retweeted by, say, the official Unity account. Mm. That was a real shock. That actually happened to me once. Uh, getting retweeted by big name YouTuber guys, uh, having them do videos about it. Thanks, Ed. <laughs> uh, you know, it's just one of those things where you got to take it day by day there's really no magic solution and if there was then I, everybody would be doing it every indie would be doing the surefire thing and then 
it would become oversaturated and it wouldn't be the surefire thing anymore. Yeah, actually you mentioned you have a publisher. I'm sure there's actually a lot of indie developers that would love to know how, how do you do that, getting a publisher? Oh my god. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, okay. Man, every, everything that I say about like how things have happened with my game dev career has happened so weirdly. Um. Mm. So I was prepared to do the normal thing. Like of, the Kickstarter? Well, even before the Kickstarter, I was prepared to do the normal thing of sending out emails to dozens and dozens of publishers and oh, okay. doing all of the uh how do you say all the negotiations and whatnot. But what ended up happening was I started to make a big old list of all the publishers that I wanted and they were in tiers. There were like the top tier ones were the ones that I like really, really wanted. If they answered my email, then uh, those were the, be the ones that I would answer first. Mm -hmm. Then there would be the ones below that and then below that and then below that. And in my number one spot was Top Hat. And the thing it, based on their uh, performance with games like Ova Magica and Shibo and whatnot. So then all of a sudden, about a week later, after making that list, when I was about to do the emails, Pop Hat DM'd me on Twitter. They were the first publishers to ever DM me, aside from something that happened like a few years ago, not related to Myth Caller. And I, I thought I was dreaming. I had to <laughs> punch myself in the arm to make sure that, nah, I'm just in bed right now. I'm snoozing away. No, this is real. <laughs> Very mm -hmm. first one was my number one, and I answered it. And of course, I couldn't let them know that because I still had to negotiate with them. <laughs> yeah. So I had to keep a poke her face while on call with these guys and oh my god on the was inside it with was, camera uh no okay but it was i couldn't it sound excited yeah <laughs> so like even though there was no camera it was still really hard mm -hmm. to find or to not be super excited over this i did the negotiations it went really well the next day we had top head so i would like to give a bit more advice on how to get a publisher uh but the only thing I can give is the generic advice of like, make sure your stuff looks good and <laughs> make sure your emails are well put together, proofread, use Grammarly, you know, but yeah. else than that, uh, personal experience. This was experience... sponsored by Grammarly. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess this this sounds like very awfully like those like manifestations, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, where like you just like super super really want something and then yeah. you work really just hard. Just manifest in it, it into reality. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, By the way, manifestation guru, whoever's overwatching this, I really really want a bazillion dollars. <laughs> yes, and a Lamborghini while we're at it. Yeah. No, actually, Make it I don't like cars. Make give give me an e-bike. Yeah. What is the favorite part about working on the game? See, that's something that I kind of go back and forth about a lot. Uh, there are times where I'm like, yeah, I really like making this level design. And then a few days later, I'm still working on it. And I'm like, you know what? I hate this now. Mm -hmm. I wish I was making attacks. And then I would start to make attacks for monsters and I would start to like it at first. And then I would start to hate it as I keep having to adjust it more and more and more to make it fun. So I would say it jumps around. You know, usually when I first start any particular aspect of the game, that's going to be more fun than refining it. Mm -hmm. But then when it comes to outside the game itself, I would say just interacting with the fan base in general, uh, just hanging out on the Discord, Twitter comments and whatnot. That's also really fun too. Mm. Yeah, the, funny how you mentioned you started hating things because the next question was going to be what do you hate the most about making your game? Oh boy! <laughs> <laughs> you can mention there multiple things. Multiple things. Oh, there are a lot of things. Uh, making games is... I know it can seem like a circus at first. Like it's really fun all the time from the outside. From the inside, oh my god, there's probably more things that I dislike than I like about it. Mm -hmm. uh, there are times where I'll start to make something like a, a collision system for a wall or whatnot. Something that a, a lay person might not think is that complicated. But I will be 
hammering away at this thing for like a solid 40 hours of development time. <laughs> hammering away at it, trying desperately to get it to do what I want. And it just won't. And you'll be staring at the code like, what the hell am so, I doing wrong? So it's bugs. Yeah, it, bugs. Uh, the bugs that are super persistent. Yeah. That's the thing. Uh, there are bugs that are simple. Bugs that, you know, take an hour tops. Maybe a bit tedious, but nothing that bad. It's the bugs that stay for multiple days in a row that no matter what, no matter what you do, they're just not getting solved. You can look online for solutions. Mm -hmm. You might find some stack overflow uh, answer on Google. You'll plug it in and it won't work or like someone will be asking the question, but then no one would be answering. So it's like, crap, what do I do? And you're just sitting there staring at the screen like, I have to do this, but how do I do it? <laughs> it's just not working. I hate yeah. that so much. Unity can be very frustrating with that. Mm. I, I know, especially especially now, people have kind of started to come around to Unity not really being the best. <laughs> but there's a lot of aspects of Unity that are just straight up unfinished, including the new input system, which you need to use if you want to be on consoles. <laughs> So, you know, I need to use it, but there are certain aspects of it that are just not finished. And the official answers to use a workaround? What? It's been months! <laughs> Why are yeah. you forcing me to use this when it's not finished? All right. Well, last question. The the plus in the backstage plus usually unrelated to the game itself. Hence why it's not backstage, but a plus. <laughs> um, yeah. That is, uh, you said you wanted to be a novelist. So what is your favorite book and why? So it's, <laughs> you know, I would probably say, and I'm going to seem super basic for this, mm. but Return of the King, uh, the third volume of The Lord of the Rings. Mm. I do like a lot of Discworld too, but I gotta say classics just beat it out just by a little bit. Hmm. All right, I'll stop recording then.